All right, Ecclesiastes for Beginners. This is uh, the name of this class, uh, lesson number five in our series. Uh, a Time for Everything, part two. We did part one last week. Uh, so in the, uh, in the journal that uh, Solomon um, is writing, he has uh, described the various ways that uh, he sought for satisfaction and joy apart from God. I think that's, the, you know, that's as much as I can compress um, the idea of what's going on in this particular book. Solomon is kind of watching himself and taking notes about the various lifestyles that he has experimented with. And we have said so far, uh, he has pursued wisdom and found that increased wisdom only brings increased pain and, and grief. He has pursued pleasure and found it to be, to be empty, pleasurable, Pleasurable, yes, but empty, couldn't build on it. He has pursued, uh, or rather he has examined the prudent life and the foolish life and seen that both of them end in death. So one is in the end not any better than the, than the other. He's sought meaning in work and he's discovered that work is hard, not always profitable and cannot be brought to the grave. Another cheerful thought. And he has even examined life events and found no meaning other than the fact that the key events in life are cyclical in nature and they are pointless in the end. So he's done a lot of experimenting, a lot of living, but his final conclusion, you know, everything is vanity. Today we'd say life is the pits, life is the pits. That's his general conclusion. Now remember, his general conclusion thus far is that life lived apart from God is the pits. However, in a flash of insight, he informs us that God has literally designed it that way. So you know, when we were looking at the, uh, the overview of this particular um, book, we said that he comes to conclusions at the very end, and he does. But at, at times during his, you know, the writing of his journal, he kind of gets flashes of inspiration and he shares that uh, with his reader. Chuck Swindoll in the study guidebook, um, based on his book, On the Ragged Edge, uh, he says, God has created us with a God-shaped vacuum that only He can fill. And until He does, life is little more than hell on earth. Interesting that uh, Time Magazine a while back had an article that stated that man's search for the divine is gen genetically based, the God gene. I remember a lot of people writing about that and remember this, uh, this actual cover in Time Magazine. So in the balance of this chapter, Solomon gives some final thoughts on the search for meaning in the events of one's life lived out here on earth and he shares both positive and negative insights. So he starts with the, you know, the vertical view, the vertical view in chapter three, if you're following along, chapter three beginning verse 11. If man is able to look beyond the events or the times of his life here on earth and develop a, a vertical viewpoint, one that sees life from an eternal perspective, he will then discern certain things. And Solomon lists these in the next uh, several verses. So in his search for meaning, he's looked for meaning under the sun, meaning apart from God. He's tried pleasure and work and building projects and uh, you know, all kinds of things. He's come to the conclusion that life under the sun, life apart from God, has no meaning. So now he's, you know, he begins looking beyond life under the sun. Here's some of the conclusions he comes to. Number one, he says, God does make sense from chaos. Verse 11, he, meaning God, he has made everything appropriate in its time. The Hebrew there, that word appropriate also is beautiful. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. And so Solomon notes that the presence of God gives appropriate meaning and purpose for everything that He has made. For example, 
In Psalm 19.1 the writer says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. So the stars, if you just look up at the stars and you say, man, there sure are a lot of stars up there and they're up there every night and the more we, you know, the more we look, the more stars we find. That's well, it's pretty amazing stuff. That's the thought of life under the sun. You can't go any further than that. Maybe we can start counting them. Maybe we can start looking to see if there are other people out there, but I mean, it doesn't go beyond that. But if you've got a vertical view, including God in your view of life, then the stars exist to declare His glory. Why are they up there? They're there to declare the glory of God. How marvelous is God, how strong and powerful He is that He's created all of this where we can't count the stars, we can't see all of them. Imagine, there are things that He has created that we will never even see in our whole life and yet they, they, you know, they, they function, they have purpose, and yet we're, we're, we're not even aware of these things. That's how great God is. Another example, in Psalm 150, He says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The psalmist here is declaring that the voices and the noises of all life are there for what purpose? To praise God. It's not just crickets uh, making their noise and you know, the noises of the night. It's not just that. When we have a vertical view of God, we realize that all animals, even as they're living out their lives and doing what they were created to do, in their own way, give honor to, to God. Uh, Romans chapter uh, 8, 28, Paul says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Again, all events, whether they are good or bad, serve God's purpose. And for those who believe, the advantage is that all events ultimately work for good. For disbelievers, everything taken together is meaningless. That's what, that's what Solomon's point, that's what he's saying. He's looked at everything, he's tried everything, and it all comes to nothing, no meaning, unless, unless you have a vertical view and understand that God is there. Then everything does take on meaning. So in making us, God has created beings that live in the context of time, but He has granted us that quality of being that will be able to transcend the dimension of time and step into eternity. Something that plants and animals and minerals you know, can't do. Animals, no matter how bright they are, no matter if you can train them, woof, woof, oh, that's two, you know, and say dog and bark. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like dog. Well, I taught my dog to talk, right? No matter what you do with the animals, to, you know, train them to do whatever, they cannot step into eternity. God has not given them that ability, but He's given us that ability. So how does the temporal become eternal? How does that which has a beginning have no end? By faith, by faith. I accept that God will do this for me just as He produced a son from the dead womb of Sarah and resurrected a very dead Lazarus. Against all the evidence to the contrary, I believe in the resurrection because all the evidence is to the contrary. Under the sun, everything dies. Everything, everyone grows old and they pass it one time or another. All the evidence says, well, that's not true. But by faith, I believe that God is there and will resurrect me. Another conclusion that he comes to, God enables us to enjoy our lives. Verse 12 and 13, he says, I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor, it is the gift of God. So the presence of God motivates us to do what is right and to find purpose in our existence, thus bringing us joy. You know, that men do good, that they find meaning in their lives, that they enjoy the blessings of earth, 
the joy that one feels on account of these things is really a gift from God because altruism and work in abundance without God cannot sustain happiness. It can bring happiness for a time, but it cannot sustain it. It is God's presence in the midst of these things that generates lasting satisfaction. You know, the idea is that you know, being rich, you know, when they say, you know, oh, rich people are not happy. Wrong. What do you mean rich people are not happy? They're plenty happy. <laughs> They're having fun. They don't have to worry about making the rent. So being rich you know, does lead to happiness, but only for a short while. That's the problem. And wealth does not automatically produce peace of mind. Because if it did, all those rich people wouldn't be killing themselves, or drinking themselves to death, or drugging themselves to death. that we're able to enjoy our work as a carpenter or as a teacher or as a whatever you do, that we can enjoy it and it gives us satisfaction. It's a gift that God gives to us, whether we acknowledge Him or not. That's how good He is. And when we give something, we, we, like, we appreciate the fact that somebody will say thank you. Because you ever give somebody a gift or something like that and they don't say thank you, they don't acknowledge it, and then it, the time comes around the following year to give the gift, you remember it. That guy didn't say, he didn't even thank me for what I did. Does he get a gift again the second year? Well, you know, if, if, we, if we submit to our better nature, yes. <laughs> but the impulse is, well, pff, ingratitude, ingrate, I'm not giving you anything. But we have a God that, that gives to people that don't acknowledge Him and don't say thank you. And yet He continues to enable them to enjoy what they do. It's a gift from God. Another conclusion, God provokes us to worship Him. Verses 14 and 15. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it and there is nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear Him. That which uh, has been, uh, excuse me, that which is has been already and that which will be has already been. For God seeks what has passed by. So God is greater than man or creation. You know, he's greater than what's, what has been. He's greater than what's coming. He's greater than man and creation. Man can violate nature. He can try to change nature. He can try to save nature, but he can't improve it. Why some types of genetic engineering, you know? Dangerous thing, dangerous thing. God has so made creation and man that exploration of the universe only leads to greater and greater respect and praise for God. The more man finds out about the creation, the more he is in awe, the more complex it becomes. You know, Anthony Flew, I don't know if you know that name, Anthony Flew, uh, leading atheist, writer, philosopher. Uh, he was the, uh, you know, King of the atheists, his books set the pace for atheism for many, many years. And he was converted, not to Christianity, but to deism, meaning believing that God exists and God created everything. And in his book he, he says he was converted to believing in God because he recognized that the integrated complexity of the universe could not be logically explained by evolution. It had to be design. It had to be you know, a mind, a great mind. And this is, this is the person you know, who wrote the book or, wrote, or, 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 or was the leading proponent of atheism, who provided arguments for lesser people to, you know, to, to argue the case for atheism. And eventually, he wasn't, he wasn't convinced by somebody who could out-argue him in a debate. He was convinced, he said, I follow the evidence no matter where it leads. No matter where it leads, he said. 
And he said, the scientific evidence led me to this conclusion. There's no other answer. It's just too complex, too complicated. And so you know, Solomon is saying this 3,000 years ago. We keep learning what has been learned and forgotten. We can never quite wrap our minds around it all. The whole continues to elude us. God is always and will always be greater than His creation. And this God demonstrates to the believer to his joy and to his prayer. I am so glad that he is God and not me. <laughs> that's, a, that's a wonderful discovery. I know that sounds egotistical. Well, you think you're God? We all think we're God. We all think we're God until proven otherwise. And what relief it is when we finally understand, oh, okay, you're God. I'm, I'm the created thing. You're the creator. Whew, good. It's good to get that burden off my shoulders. <laughs> so then he talks about, so that's the, the vertical view, right? Some of the conclusions. If you believe that beyond, under the sun, there's a God there, whoa, it gives meaning. It gives understanding. It gives relief and praise to your life. Then he talks about the horizontal view. He leaves the vertical view of life and he returns to a more horizontal view of things as seen by a person who only considers life from an earthly perspective. And he uses a contrast device to do this. On a strictly, you know, a strictly horizontal view breeds, well, criticism, he says, to begin with, or cynicism, excuse me. And he says that in verse 16, he says, furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice, there is wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, there is wickedness. And the key there is under the sun. Every time he switches back and forth, when he says under the sun, he means the horizontal view, the view you know, from the earth, earthbound view. So the first observation is one of cynicism. When seeing things horizontally, the conclusion or the feeling you eventually end up with is cynicism. Cynicism is a sense of disillusionment, a feeling that no good exists. It is a step removed from despair. You have cynicism and then the next step is hopelessness or despair. And cynicism occurs when there is injustice and oppression that goes on unpunished for too long. You know, many developing countries suffer from this and it leads to corruption. We mention Haiti because we have experience in Haiti. You know, we have missionaries there, so on and so forth. And I mean, all the money that was raised because of the hurricanes and the earthquake is still sitting somewhere because they can't find you know, people to handle the money properly so that it gets to the people. They're one of the most corrupt countries in the world. The people are poor there for many reasons, but one reason in particular is that the leaders of that country have been so corrupt for so long. Solomon mentions the cause for his cynicism actually in several places throughout this book. Read a couple of them. In chapter four, for example, he says, then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun, and behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead, more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. How's that for cynicism? Never mind you're better off dead. You're better off never even being born. Another place where he talks about this, chapter five, verse eight. If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official and there are high of higher officials over them. I think today we call that systemic corruption. You know, newspaper people say, well, the corruption you know, goes to the very top. Well, that's what he's talking about here. And then in, um, 
chapter 8, verse 9, verse 9, he says, All this I have seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, where, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. I see this, he says, at every level. Even the dog catcher, you know, <laughs> is grasping for a bribe. So he sees that in life there is not always a happy ending, that the bad guys win, that children die, that the wicked have happy lives and the good and faithful wife is beaten and abandoned and nobody cares or worse still, no justice. That's the view from under the sun. So the horizontal view of injustice easily, almost eventually and inevitably leads to cynicism. And so he offers some solutions here. He compares cynicism to the vertical view. He offers some ways to deal with the despairing cynicism caused by the strictly horizontal view of life. And so one of the things he says, realize that injustice is temporary. Verse 17, I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for, time, uh, for a time, for every matter, and for every deed is there. In other words, <laughs> your judgment is coming. If you have a vertical view, if you have a horizontal view, uh, if you don't get justice in this life, you don't get justice. You were born poor, you lived as an oppressed person, and you died miserably, and that was the end of your life, period. He says, however, if you have a vertical view, then realize no matter how bad it is, God will execute justice one day. Everyone will be judged and no one will escape judgment. No one will escape judgment. Justice is only delayed, not canceled. We need to commit the hurts and offenses to God who will make a righteous and final judgment at the appropriate time. I mean, that gives hope to someone who is living under some kind of oppression that they themselves cannot you know, throw off a recognition that God, God will, you know, He will execute a fair and righteous judgment one day. Uh, another conclusion or solution to cynicism, realize that injustice condemns man. Verse 18, he said, I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath and there is no advantage for man over beast, for all is vanity. All go to the same place. All came from the dust and all return to the dust. Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of the beasts descends downward to the earth. Kind of a tricky passage here. A lot of people use this to say, you know, doggy heaven. <laughs> yeah, and Spencer, we have, a, we have a dog cemetery, we have an animal cemetery, you know, I mean, with, with uh, tombstones and flowers and things like that. Some people really love their pets. So the justice of God, he says, will judge those who have acted like beasts in devouring others towards injustice. This is what he's talking about. He's comparing you know, men acting like animals. Here, there is a parenthetical statement concerning a comparison between men and animals. He says, since both humans and animals die and return to dust, the horizontal thinker may think that this justifies him acting like a beast while he is alive. The ultimate danger of the theory of evolution is it makes us all beasts. We are simply beasts. We're simply a higher form of animal. And he says here, if we're just a higher form of animal, then we can tear and devour each other to get what we want. I mean, the dog goes into the ground, then we go into the ground. Who cares? Get what you can, the way you can, while you can. But Solomon asks the question in verse 21, how do you know that only after the grave the true difference between man and beast will be seen, as one remains in the dust, the animal, but the other ascends to God for judgment, 
and then it'll be too late. So his point is you act like an animal, you die like an animal, but it doesn't mean you won't be judged like a human being. So a life of injustice will condemn a man as acting like a beast. However, unlike a beast who remains in the dust, a man's soul will go and face God for having acted like a beast rather than like a man made in the image of God. There's his point. And then he talks about um, hope beyond cynicism. Verse 22, I have seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in his activities, for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? Hope beyond cynicism. Solomon's exhortation in the final verse is to face injustice, and we all suffer from it personally or corporately to a greater or lesser degree. Let's face it, some rules are not fair where we work, other people get ahead when we should have gotten ahead and whatever. You know, the guy at the garage you know, rips you off. You know, all, all he needed to do was change some oil. Instead he put in a brand new transmission and charge you four thousand. You know, we, we, all, we all have these things happen, happen to us. He doesn't advise his readers to try to understand the why of all of these circumstances or retaliate with bitterness or cynicism or retreat into our closets in resentful silence. He says that we may not be able to alter our lot in life, but we can change our response to it. All of us have injustice we face that tempt us to become cynical and depressed. So here are three questions to ask ourselves in order to change that hopeless cynicism to hopeful realism. Question number one, what is your unjust disadvantage? Name it. When I do counseling with people, you know, especially for you know, marriage, so on and so forth, the first thing I shoot for, I ask them, explain to me in your own words what the problem is. You tell me what the problem is. And usually she says, him. <laughs> and I'll say to her, okay, what is it about him that, you know, what's the problem with him? And then I'll ask him, well, what's the problem? Let, I want you to describe what your problem is. So here, what is your unjust disadvantage? Put a name to it, explain it, put it into words. Sometimes you know, we overblow petty irritations and allow things to become out of proportion. Try to list and articulate major handicaps inflicted upon you in your life, not just overestimate petty things. I believe that's the work of Satan. A little, a little annoying thing, if he can fan that into a huge thing, so much the better, keeps you off balance, makes you miserable, denies you whatever joy God has put into that particular day for you to experience, you'll miss it. You know, Satan's tactics with us, not just, you know, oh, I'm going to tempt him to go out and rob a bank or she's going to commit adultery with an absolute, you know, no. His major work, I have found, is to try to deny you the good things that God has put into your day by overinflating petty things, by distracting you, by tempting you to do whatever. Secondly, when do you plan to replace passive self-pity with active courage? It begins with prayer, it follows with action on these things, no matter how small, that are doable. Again, I go back to my you know, counseling uh, example. Usually it's small things, little things. Oh, you guys get into a fight every night when he comes home, there's always something, you know, he's grouchy, you're grouchy. So here's a little exercise. Uh, every night when you come home, give your wife a kiss and then don't speak to each other for a half hour. <laughs> Give yourself a chance to land. 
because husbands, and I'm, I'm looking at a traditional thing here, you know, obviously both men and women both work in this day and age, and that's also good advice. You both come home, give each other a kiss, and then don't talk to each other for a half hour. Give yourself, just because your body's in the house doesn't mean your spirit has landed yet. And I say that simply to say, it's just a little step, just a small thing to, you know, and then a half hour later, so how was your day? <laughs> the key, of course, is always to begin. Take the first step, even if you're not sure what the second step is going to be. Let the Lord work in your life, because sometimes He only shows us the first step. We don't see the second, you know, we see the tenth step and we see the first step but we don't see two, three you know, to nine. Well, that's, that's called faith. He's not asking us to jump from zero to 10. I don't believe in this idea of you know, a leap of faith. That's a most regrettable term. God does not ask us to leap into the abyss, into the darkness. That's not faith. He doesn't do that to us. He's given us the Bible. He's given us you know, a visual witness of His resurrection. We got something to go on. He usually gives us the first step. But we have to take that first step knowing that you know, He'll give us the second step in due time and then the third and the fourth and so on and so forth. Third question, how can God use you? Not how can you use God, how can God use you? How many times does that prayer escape our lips? God, show me you know, how I can serve you today instead of, okay, God, here, uh, listen, I got a long list. I haven't got a lot of time. You know? <laughs> I need this, 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 this. The Lord uses everything in your life for His purpose, everything. Seek for ways that God can use your disadvantage to His advantage. Your pain, your failure, your struggle can be the stepping stone for someone else's victory. Most of the time, the element that makes the circumstances constructive or destructive is our attitude. We cannot always change circumstances, but we can change our attitude about our circumstances. You know, it isn't circumstances that glorifies God or inspires other people. It's attitude, because faith shines forth not in events, but in the way people respond to events. Changing our attitude will change our lives many times from cynicism to hope. And that's the main lesson that he is giving here. If you only see things you know, on a horizontal basis, nothing gives you hope. Because as Solomon concluded, everything ends in death. The fool who cares nothing for tomorrow, who lives carelessly, one day will die. And the wise man who is prudent, saves his money, does everything the right thing, what happens to him? He's going to die too. So without the, ver uh, without the vertical view, none of these things you know, make sense or give us any type of hope. But our faith in God, the greatest gift that He's given us, the ability to recognize that He is there, that gives meaning to everything and gives us courage to face the things that are difficult in life. And let's face it, nobody gets through life without facing difficult things. Okay, so that's our lesson for today, chapter 3, 11 to 22. We'll move on next time. Thank you for your attention.